All right, welcome back to The Impactful Scholar. I'm your host, Dr. Javad T. Hashmi. Today, we're picking up where we left off last time and talking about the Torah and the Gospel. Does the Quran consider these to be abrogated or canceled out? Does the Quran consider these books to be so heavily corrupted that they're no longer usable? Is it like a software update where the previous software pro program or iOS system will no longer run? That's a terrible analogy, but that's one that I've heard often from Muslims. But in any case, the point is that none of this is the case. In fact, the Quran not only doesn't espouse any of these views, but the Quran says to the, the Quran endorses the Torah and the Gospel, and it tells Jews and Christians to follow their Torah and the Gospel. And more importantly, it tells believers, that is, and now we would use the word Muslims or capital M Muslim, it tells them to believe in the Torah and the Gospel as well. It's not talking about some imaginary Torah and gospel that doesn't exist now. It's talking about the Torah and the gospel that exists in the hands of Jews and Christians. Now, I admit, there is an open question here about what exactly the Quran is referring to as the Torah and the gospel. That's open for discussion, and maybe we'll talk about it in another video. I do know that I have some difference of opinion with my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Khalil Andani, on this point. I do think that it's referring to the Torah and the gospel that is with the Jews and Christians currently because the Quran says for them to follow the Torah and the gospel that is with them, which simply would not make any sense if it was talking about some previous scripture that doesn't exist anymore. Having said that, I do think that the Quran uh, has a different view of revelation in general, where whereby um, revelation is something more than just the text or the ink on the page. Instead, the books that we have are simply an instantiation of the divine book that is with God, the heavenly tablet. And even the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran, in some sense, are other than what we have in our hands exactly, which is more of an instantiation of that thing. So that creates some complexity and nuance that we'll explore in another video. But right now, we're just going to counter this view that the Quran considers the Torah and the Gospel to be abrogated or canceled out or heavily corrupted to the point of being unusable. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, but before we go any further, please make sure to like, subscribe, and you know what? Heck, just share it right now before you even finish watching this video. But make sure to subscribe, please. All right, so in the previous video, we talked about how the Quran does not um, pass a blanket statement on Jews and Christians. Instead, it says some people of the book um, are good and some of them are bad. Some verses say many of them are bad or most of them are bad, but what the Quran definitely does not do is say that all of them are bad. Now, what's interesting is the people of the book that the Quran criticizes, the reason that it criticizes them is precisely because they do not follow the Torah and the Gospel. They do not follow the divine book given to them by God. Or that was inspired by God. So that again shows that even when the Quran is criticizing them, it's criticizing them precisely for not following the scriptures, and therefore those scriptures are not somehow canceled or abrogated compared according to the Quran. Otherwise, why would the Quran criticize them for that? So verse 62:5 of the Quran reads: The parable of those who were made to bear the Torah, then did not bear it, is that of an ass bearing books. How evil is the likeness of the people who denied God's signs, and God guides not wrongdoing people. Verse 393. All food was lawful unto the children of Israel, save what Israel had forbidden for himself before the Torah was sent down. Say, bring the Torah and recite it, if you are truthful. I think the Quran is not only endorsing the Torah and the Gospel, but it's actually pushing the Jews and the Christians to be more scripturalist. That is, the Quran is saying, follow the Torah and the Gospel, as opposed to the desires, whims, and fancies of your rabbis and scholars. So the Quran is moving in this scripturalist direction, which is precisely why it uses the word people of the book. Now, keep in mind, Jews and Christians, at least as far as I know, don't call themselves people of the book. So the Quran is using this term. It's using this term as a sign of honor, but at the same time, the Quran has, in its sense, its own agenda, which is to kind of stress on them to be scripturalists, follow your scripture that is divinely inspired. Your rabbis and priests are not divinely inspired. So I think there's a move towards uh, focusing on the written law, as opposed to the written Torah, that, so to speak, as opposed to the oral, to oral Torah or the oral law, which is interesting because Muslims also, as we found out in the video that we made on Hadith versus Sunnah, or, or the different, you know, Hadith over Quran or Sunnah over Quran, um, that video when I 
had the clips of Jonathan Brown in it. But um, the point is that Muslims, we also followed oral tradition or oral um, scripture uh, that is hadith over the written Quran. And that video talks, we talk about that. But interestingly, the Quran is moving away from this direction. And the reason why, I mean, if you were, even if you were a secular historian, you could say that the reason why Prophet Muhammad and the Quran are doing that is because uh, the Quran is actually pushing the, these Jews and Christians to become part of the submitting community under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad. So it's, it's tearing them away from their kind of church or uh, you know, rabbinical authorities and you know, realigning them with Prophet Muhammad as the leader of this submitters community where they all respect the, their divine scriptures, whether it's the Torah, Gospel, and the Quran, and each of them are reading their own scriptures under the leadership of Prophet Muhammad himself. So it's quite complex. But the point is, the Quran does not consider the Torah and the Gospel to be totally corrupted. Verse 378 reads, And there is indeed a group among them who twist their tongues with the book, that you may suppose it to be from the book. But it is not from the book. And they say it is from God, though it is not from God. And they knowingly speak a lie against God. And we, we spoke about this verse in the previous video. Verse 446. Among those who are Jews are those who distort the meaning of the word and say we hear and disobey. And hear as one who hears not and attend to us, twisting their tongues and disparaging religion. Again, what's interesting is that in each of these verses, the Quran is talking about their recitation or their interpretation of scripture it's not talking about the actual books themselves the written torah or the gospel so when it's talking about corruption it's talking about their recitation or their interpretation verse 5 13 then for their breaking of their covenant we curse them and harden their hearts they distort the meaning of the word again it's not this the actual physical writing it's the meaning of the word and i've forgotten part of that whereof they were reminded you will not cease to discover their treachery for all save a few of them. Again, hearkening back to our previous video, again, the Quran has this kind of escape clause where it's saying not all of them are like this. And what's the Quranic commandment? So pardon them and forbear. Truly God loves the virtuous. So our attitude should be one of pardoning and forbearance. Not this kind of animosity that you unfortunately see in the polemical or apologetic scene in which uh, Muslims are viciously attacking Christians. And of course, it's reciprocated as well, but we need to observe a high pattern of conduct because we consider the Christians and the Jews to be people of the book. We honor them in that way. Now there is one verse of the Quran that might indicate textual corruption. This is verse 279. So woe unto those who write the book with their own hands. They say this is from God, that they may sell it for a paltry price. So woe unto them for what their hands have written and woe unto them for what they earn. However, even if you look at the commentaries here, it doesn't seem to be that they are talking about the actual written scripture necessarily, the Torah and the gospel. Rather, it seems to be something in addition to the book. So it's something completely different. And there's all sorts of reasons why we should think that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Another reason why we should not consider the Torah and the gospel to be completely unusable is because the Quran itself says to look at the Torah and the gospel because that has the proof for the truth of Prophet Muhammad in it. So verse 7157 reads, Those who follow the messenger, the Gentile prophet, whom they find inscribed in the Torah and the gospel that is with them. So that verbiage right there, that is with them, is why I think it refers to current Jews and Christians. I mean, sorry, current, the current Torah and gospel with the Christians and the Jews and the Christians. So the verse goes on. Who enjoins upon them what is right and forbids them what is wrong. One of the reasons why it may have been the case that Muslims, and by the way, there was this debate in early Islam about whether or not the Torah and the Gospel were um, abrogated or not. In fact, for a, you know, a significant amount of time in early Islam, there were people who were of the opinion that you can actually consult the Torah and the Gospel to understand the Quran. And I think that's actually the correct understanding that we should have had and kept. But I think one of the reasons why we moved away from that interpretation is because of this verse. Because it seems like this verse is saying that Prophet Muhammad is predicted in the Torah and the Gospel. And then I'm, you know, I'm sure that these Muslims looked at the Torah and the Gospel up and down and could not find any such verse. And so they concluded then it must be that it was in those books, but then it was taken out. And so they must come to the view that those texts are corrupted and no longer usable. However, 
we can take this in a more sophisticated way and say that the Quran is not necessarily saying that the word, you know, the Prophet Muhammad is specifically named in the Quran explicitly and literally. Instead, the Quran could be using a more typological approach where um, the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad is typologically prefigured in the Bible. And, you know, a lot of Christians will be critical of Muslims for making this claim, but that's ironic because Christians read the Old Testament as prefiguring Christ, and they use typological exegesis in order to make that claim. So typological exegesis means that you say, yes, literally, this verse is referring to, say, another prophet. For example, it might be predicting um, John, the Baptist. But in some other sense, it's actually speaking about Jesus Christ. So that's what typological exegesis is. And I think that is probably what the Quran is talking about right here, because I don't think the Quran would make such a facile claim when clearly there were Jews and Christians in that area who would have said, no, Prophet Muhammad is not mentioned in our books, at least not explicitly. All right, verse 7159 then says, and among the people of Moses is a community that guides by the truth and does justice thereby. So again, it's showing that there is a current group of Jews who are righteous, um, and that's why uh, it's telling them to look at their Torah. The Quran not only doesn't say that these are abrogated, uh, but it actually says for them to observe the Torah and the Gospel. And these verses are quite shocking to many Muslims who don't haven't read these verses or haven't looked at these verses carefully. Verse 566 reads, Had they observed the Torah and the Gospel and that which was sent down unto them from their Lord, they would surely have received nourishment from above them and from beneath their feet. There is a moderate community among them, but as for many of them, evil is that which they do. Now, here in this verse, this passage, it says not only to follow the Torah and the Gospel, it's possible that it's also talking about the Quran here, and that which was sent down unto them from their Lord. It's possible, and we'll talk about that. But it's also possible that it's simply referring to the past revelations that they already have. We'll circle back to this point shortly. A subsequent verse, 568, reads, Say, O people of the book, you stand on nothing till you observe the Torah and the Gospel. That's pretty emphatic, that you need to follow the Torah and the Gospel, and if you don't, you stand on nothing. So how can we say that these books are abrogated? And, that, and then the verse goes on, and that which has been sent down unto you from your Lord. This could also, this could, again, refer, reference the Quran. My reading of the Quran tells me that this submitter's community, which consisted of believers, Jews, Christians, and other monotheists, they respected all of the divine scriptures. That included the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran. They each individually followed their own books when it came to the laws. So for example, Jews followed Torah law. The Christians followed the Torah plus the Gospel, the kind of the amendments or modifications in the Gospel. And then the believers followed Quranic law. But they all respected each other's scriptures as divinely inspired, even though they thought that they only needed to follow their particular book. And that's why the Quran can say to the people of the book that they should follow their Torah or their gospel and also they should believe in what was sent down, meaning the Quran. The religious exclusivist will point to these verses and say, aha, see, they, the Jews and Christians need to believe in the Quran. And if they believe in the Quran, then they must be Muslim, capital M, Muslim. But what they don't mention is the fact that there are also verses that tell the believers that they need to believe in not only the Qur'an, but also the Torah and the Gospel. And that goes against the religious exclusivist view that the Torah and the Gospel are abrogated. So the Qur'an does not consider these previous books to be completely corrupted, only hidden. And the Qur'an is calling on the Jews and the Christians to go back to this you know, scripturalist approach and to stop hiding their scripture. So verse 515 reads, O people of the book, our messenger has come unto you, making clear to you much of what you once hid of the book, and pardoning much. There has come unto you from God a light and a clear book. So actually what the Quran is saying that the Prophet Muhammad came as someone who's clarifying the scriptures that came before with the Quran itself. Again, that doesn't mean that the Jews and Christians have to follow Quranic law. It simply means that the Quran is elucidating a proper approach to even approaching the Torah and the Gospel. And in this sense, I do believe that within the submitting community, that is the early following of Prophet Muhammad. And that's just another term that now they say the Jesus movement as opposed to Christians. It would be clearly ahistoric, ahistorical to say that uh, Jesus' followers or, followers or disciples were Christians. Um, so we use the word Jesus movement. Similarly, we would say that 
uh, the prophet's followers were this submitting community and um, or submitters. And so the submitters, they respected all of the divine books. Another couple verses that talk about following the Torah and the gospel, verse 544, truly was sent down the Torah wherein is a guidance and a light. So far from being corrupted, the Torah ha is a guidance and a light by which the prophets who submitted unto God judged those who are Jews. Did you see that? Right there it's saying, this is for the Jews. All right? So it is saying that the Torah is for the Jews. It's not saying the Jews need to follow the Quran. It's saying the Torah is for the Jews. As did the sages and the rabbis in accordance with such of God's book as they were bidden to preserve. Whosoever judges not by that which God has sent down, it is they who are disbelievers. Now this entire passage that we're talking about, it's actually a passage that's quite interesting. It shows the more nominal role that the Prophet Muhammad played amongst the wider submitters community in Medina. He was not a caliph, he was not a king, he was not a sultan, he was not an emperor, but instead he was brought to Medina as an arbiter, an, an arbiter between warring factions in Medina to bring peace as a holy man. This is not an unheard of thing in that time. Holy men were used to be uh, called upon to strike peace, especially if they came from, a, if they were neutral outsiders. And that is the role that Prophet Muhammad took when he came to Medina. We know this from the Constitution of Medina, or the so-called Constitution of Medina. In the Constitution of Medina, we saw how the Prophet Muhammad was called in as a religious arbiter. And this is as a, as Nikolai Sinai says, as a last resort arbiter. If the warring sides could not come to a resolution, they were to come to the Prophet Muhammad to seek resolution. This lines up with what we read in this passage in Surah 5, in which the Jews and the Christians are coming to the Prophet Muhammad for a religious judgment. Now the Quran is actually hesitant to have the Prophet Muhammad arbitrate for them, which is interesting. So not only is the Quran exhibiting kind of a lower prophetology here, in the sense that the Prophet Muhammad is a religious arbiter, but it's actually saying that they shouldn't even come to the Prophet Muhammad unless they absolutely need to because they have the Torah with them and they should just follow the Torah since that's God's word. In that sense, the Quran envisions the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran to be parallel scriptures that all contain the same truths, even if the specific laws are different. Verse 547 says, Let the people of the Gospel judge by what God has sent down therein. Now it's telling the Christians that you have the Gospel. Follow the Gospel. You don't need to come to the Prophet Muhammad for a judgment when you have the Gospel. Whosoever judges not by that which God has sent down, it is they who are iniquitous. Again, how could the Quran be telling the Christians to go follow their gospel. This simply does not make sense if the gospel was abrogated with the coming of the Quran. How can this verse, I challenge the religious exclusivists, how can this verse be talking about Jew Christians of the past? The Torah is com considered complete for guidance according to the Quran, 6154. Then we gave unto Moses the book, complete for those who would be virtuous as an exposition of all things and as a guidance and a mercy that perhaps they might believe in the meeting with their Lord. This is verbiage that you would expect for the Quran. It's used for the Torah. That's very interesting. So the Quran, far from being an abrogator of these previous scriptures, the Quran came to confirm and protect the Torah and the gospel. Verse 548, And we have sent down unto you the book in truth, confirming the book that came before it, and as a protector over it, so judge between them in accordance with what God has sent down. So now this is in that same passage that we were talking about earlier, in which the Quran is actually saying, why are these Jews coming to you for judgment when they have the Torah with them? But if they do come, you, come to you for judgment, then you judge, and you judge with the Quran, because of course Muhammad is a believer. So uh, here we're seeing again that parallelism between the Torah, Gospel, and the Quran. To reiterate a point that I made before, but I didn't show the Quranic passages, so I'll do that right now. Even though, yes, the Qur'an says that the Jews and the Christians need to believe in the Qur'an, the Qur'an also tells the believers that they need to believe in the Torah and the Gospel. And clearly it's the Torah and the Gospel that's with them at that time. That is, they need to respect it. That doesn't mean that they need to follow the, the laws and, the, and the, spe the specific laws and the theological beliefs in those books. Instead, it simply means that you need to respect that as having some divine source behind them. So verse 34, 31 reads, the disbelievers say, we shall not believe in this Qur'an, nor in that which was before it. Verse 4, 136. O you who believe, believe in God and his messenger and the book he sent down upon his messenger, that is the Qur'an, and the book he sent down before. What is that talking about? Well, it's talking about the Torah and the Gospel. 
Whosoever does not believe in God and his angels and his books and his messengers and the last day has wandered far astray. So I argue that main, you know, today Muslims do not follow this part of the Quran because they don't believe in the books. At least they don't respect the Torah and the gospel today. Verse 29, 46. And dispute not with the people of the book, save in the most virtuous manner, unless it be those of them who have done wrong. And say, we believe in that which was sent down unto us, that is the Quran, and what was sent down unto you, the Torah and the gospel, that is with you. Our God and your God are one, and unto him we are submitters. So the Quran is saying to the believers to tell the people of the book that we not only worship the same God, we respect your scriptures just like you should respect our scriptures. And the reason why the Quran can say all of this is because according to the Quranic cosmology, there's one book with God, one kitab. Different revelations are instantiations or expressions of the kitab with God. Verse 2362, And we task no soul beyond its capacity, and with us is a book that speaks in truth, and they shall not be wronged. This is talking about the divine book or the preserved tablet with God. Verse 43, verses 3 to 4. Truly we have made it an Arabic Quran that perhaps you may understand, and truly it is with us in the mother of the book. Here you see there's a difference between the Arabic Quran, which is with us, which is an instantiation of the mother of the book, which is with God. Surah 85, verses 21 to 22. Nay, it is a glorious Quran in a preserved tablet. To sum up again, the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran are seen as parallel scriptures coming from the same transcendent source. It is likely, as I've said, that the submitters, that is believers, Jews, and Christians, respected all of the scriptures as a divine, even if they followed their own respective scriptures and laws primarily. Differences between them were seen as inconsequential and mostly in the realm of law. Meanwhile, the submitters likely Quranicized the theology of the Torah and the Gospel. So, it's kind of like how you might see some Muslim Christian debates today where a Muslim will say, okay, even though I don't believe in your Bible, I'll use the Bible against you and show you how even the Bible goes against the Trinity. I think the Quran is doing a similar thing. Although the Quran is endorsing, unlike this example, the Quran is endorsing the Torah and the Gospel, the Quran is saying, even if we endorse that, you're interpreting your scripture incorrectly. And you should interpret it in this kind of Quranicized fashion, with this more pure form of monotheism in mind. And I think that's what the Quran is arguing for, that's what the Prophet Muhammad argued for, and there were some Jews and Christians who were actually buying it and became part of the submitters' community, even though for many of us it's hard to believe, why would they do that if the Quran is demanding so much of them? The Quran in one sense is saying that you need to affirm the Prophet Muhammad in some sense, perhaps even as a prophet of God, as I've talked about. You need to uh, believe in the Quran as being divine, even if you don't need to follow Quranic law. Most Jews and Christians wouldn't agree to that today, certainly. But I think that the Pro Prophet Muhammad was so charismatic, his charisma was so much that he definitely convinced some Jews and Christians who were inspired by him and also were convinced by his Quranic ideas when it came to monotheism. So I do think it's very possible that many Christians were pushed in a Unitarian direction from the arguments that are in the Quran especially when the Qur'an doesn't insist that they need to convert out of their religion. So I think this would have been very compelling to some Christians at that time. Another recap point that I'll make, the Qur'an describes Jews and the Christians as people of the book and stresses scripturalism, that is, that they should follow their scriptures as opposed to their rabbis and religious scholars. And that, we should look at the verse that talks about taking the rabbis and scholars as lords aside from God is shirk according to the Qur'an. Um, so the Qur'an is going against this kind of, um, uh, you know, oral law, oral tradition, this rabbinical authority. And I would say that I think if we read the Qur'an properly, we'll understand that the Qur'an is against this kind of institution of the ulama that we have, where the ulama are the ones who arbitrate for us. You know, we don't even read the Qur'an directly. Instead, we go to the ulama to pass us fatwas on this or that, and all their fatwas are based on oral law and, and traditions, not on the Qur'an. I think we need to realize that some of these Qur'anic condemnations actually are directed at us. Now, by the Qur'an stressing that Jews and Christians need to follow their scriptures instead of their religious scholars or the church or the tradition, etc., the Qur'an is thereby reassigning loyalty to God through divine scripture and ultimately to or under the Prophet Muhammad's own leadership. So I think that's the move that the Qur'an is making. So. The Qur'an considers there to be Jewish and Muslim submitters. The Jewish submitters likely saw Muhammad as a Gentile prophet who brought to the pagans to monotheism through divine revelation sent to them. 
and they probably saw the Prophet Muhammad as a mess, uh, as the Messiah or a messianic-like figure. Stephen Shoemaker has gone in a specific direction with this, um, where he really plays this aspect up. As far as Christian submitters, they were likely non-Trinitarian in orientation, reading their own scripture in this Quranicized fashion. And we've talked about previously how the Quran itself considers the Christians to have been submitters. And this is verse 380, where Jesus says, Would Jesus command you to disbelief after you're having been submitters, or muslimun? If you like the work we're doing here, please consider giving a donation to the MPAC Research Bureau, which produces The Impactful Scholar. This way we can continue to produce high quality content on a regular basis. You can give either a one-time donation or a recurring monthly contribution. We'll put the donation link down below in the description box. Thank you for your love and support.